Hi students, welcome to the muscle contraction and relaxation part of the muscle physiology lecture. I'm going to describe the phases of muscle contraction. And remember we're talking about skeletal muscles and how they are ultimately stimulated by nerves um, at what's known as the neuromuscular junction. That's just the point of contact between the axon of the nerve, which is the terminal end of that um, nerve fiber, and the muscle itself. So muscle contraction and relaxation occurs in four major phases. Um, excitation is where you have action potentials that have originated within the nerve fiber. Um, and this is a somatic motor neuron, so uh, found within the body. Um, they are basically affecting motor output, meaning they have a connection to an effector organ. In this case, it is a skeletal muscle. And they are, of course, a neuron, so that's a specialized type of cell that's only found within the nervous system. So an action potential within that nerve fiber is going to lead to action potentials within the muscle fiber. And this is the connection that has to be present in order for muscle to actually contract. A muscle has to be innervated by a nerve in order for that muscle to contract. So that's excitation. Then we have excitation contraction coupling, which is when action potentials on the nerve fiber link to the sarcolemma, which is the plasma membrane of the muscle fiber. Um, and that leads to activation of those myofilaments, your myosin and your actin. Then finally, we have contraction itself, which is the sliding filament theory, which we looked at on our crash course biology, crash course AMP video. Um, sliding filament theory is essentially when myosin and actin interact with one another and the whole sarcomere, which is the functional unit of the muscle fiber, of the um, muscle cell, um, that whole fiber will contract or shorten. Um, so there's tension there, uh, shortening will normally occur and that is contraction. And then finally, we have relaxation, which is when the muscle fiber relaxes once the nerve fiber stops stimulating it. So you no longer have uh, acetylcholine, that neurotransmitter being released, and none of the physiological mechanisms that occur as a result of that acetylcholine um, can occur from that point forward, such that you have the cessation of muscle contraction. All right, so let's look at what happens with excitation. So for excitation, basically what you're seeing here is this arrow represents the nerve signal that's coming down to the axon terminal. So this is actually part of the axon itself, which is wrapped in this um, basically an insulative sheath. And this represents your neuromuscular junction. So essentially we have what's known as the synaptic knob, which is kind of this bulbous end of the nerve itself. And then this structure here is gonna be the sarcolemma. So the sarcolemma, remember that's just the specialized term for the plasma membrane of the muscle cell. So what this is showing us is where that nerve is coming into contact with the muscle. Now this ultimately relies on calcium in the form of this ion, calcium two plus, enters the synaptic knob. So a nerve signal arise at, arrives at the axon terminal and that nerve signal prompts calcium channels to open. Calcium channel is basically just a specialized conduit through which calcium ions can travel. And then that allows calcium ions to enter that axon terminal. And then calcium will stimulate synaptic vesicles to release acetylcholine into the synaptic cleft. So essentially we have to have our nerve signal that then leads to calcium um, from this extracellular environment entering that synaptic knob. The calcium leads to uh, the synaptic vesicles which contain acetylcholine and that acetylcholine will then be released into this synaptic cleft. The synaptic cleft is simply this space. So it's a very small, of course, microscopic gap between the axon terminal and the sarcolemma. Uh, 
So these are basically just little infoldings there of the sarcolemma. And then all of these blue cylinders, those are specialized proteins that are actually acetylcholine receptors. So those are receptors built into the sarcolemma such that the sarcolemma can then respond to the acetylcholine and the effects of that can uh, be felt within the nerve, or excuse me, within the muscle fiber itself. So this is showing us a close-up, kind of a stylized view of this acetylcholine receptor. What is an acetylcholine receptor? It's a specialized protein. It's a transmembrane protein that spans the length of this lipid bilayer. So this, is, of course, is the sarcolemma. We're in the muscle cell now. And it's a protein that is specialized to bind acetylcholine. So it's kind of like a lock and key type mechanism, um, which is typical of a lot of um, biological proteins. They are very specific, and they have to be activated by uh, one specific type of molecule. In this case, it's acetylcholine. So acetylcholine will diffuse across that synaptic cleft, bind to those receptors within the sarcolemma, and those receptors are ligand-gated channels. So ligand-regulated channels, it's an ion gate that essentially will then open up to allow for the flow of ions through that. Um, for each of these acetylcholine receptors, there have to be two acetylcholine molecules um, in order for that channel to actually open up. And then when it does open, um, sodium will flow in. And remember the sodium is a positively charged ion. Our resting membrane potential here is negative 90, Let's see if I can draw this, <laughs> negative 90 millivolts. So if you have the influx of a positively charged ion, that number, that resting membrane potential is going to rise. It's going to become less negative. So that means it is depolarizing the membrane. Remember, polarization is a difference between your extracellular environment and your intracellular environment. So if you're depolarizing, you're making this number less negative and there's less of a difference between the inside of the cell and the outside of the cell. All right, so we have sodium coming in, meaning that voltage that's, that can be actually measured on that sarcolemma will rise. And then we have potassium actually flowing out. So potassium is also a positively charged ion. So essentially what's happened here is depolarization happened with sodium influx and then repolarization happens with potassium out, efflux rather, outflux, efflux, potassium out, efflux. Um, so essentially we have this very quick fluctuation in voltage and that is known as the end plate potential. That is kind of like a precursor to what's known as our action potential. All right, so then we have voltage-gated channels that are adjacent to the end plate that open in response to that end plate potential. And sodium is allowed to enter the cell and potassium is allowed to leave the cell. So essentially what has happened here is we had our influx of sodium, our efflux of potassium that occurred just within that uh, receptor, which is a ligand gated protein receptor that created the end plate potential. And then that will lead to voltage gated channels that are adjacent Again, we're still within the sarcolemma, so we're still in that same muscle fiber, but that allows for these more dedicated um, ion channels to undergo the same basic process, such that sodium is allowed to enter the cell, potassium is allowed to leave the cell, and then it's those ion movements that create the action potential. So an action potential is basically the 
membrane potential of a stimulated cell. We're not in that resting membrane potential anymore. We're in what's known as the action potential. And that is essentially setting us up for being able to actually contract a muscle. Okay, so let's move on to excitation contraction coupling. We're still looking at the same structures here. So this is the terminal end of the axon of a neuron. This would be the synaptic knob where you actually have acetylcholine being released from vesicles interacting with those ligand gated receptors. So at this point we have a wave of action potentials that spreads from the motor inflate in all directions and when that wave reaches the T tubules, those infoldings of the sarcolemma, it continues down into the cell interior. So essentially we just have this voltage change that is traveling down into the um, inner parts of that muscle fiber. When action potentials uh, reach those T tubules, they open voltage gated ion channels within them, and those channels are linked to calcium channels within this sarcoplasmic reticulum. Remember, this is a specialized term for the smooth endoplasmic reticulum of the muscle fiber, and it acts as a calcium reservoir. So at that point, the calcium channels open and allow calcium out into the cytosol, which is the fluid within the cell. So here we're just seeing our little calcium ions. And again, that's all triggered by the arrival of that action potential. Finally, we get to where that sliding filament theory um, is, is being uh, set up to occur here. We have calcium that again was released as a result of the action potential traveling down into the muscle fiber. Calcium binds to troponin of the thin filaments. Remember that troponin kind of acts like a bodyguard. It blocks the binding sites for the myosin heads. And, you know, if there's not calcium present, that troponin is going to be actively blocking those binding sites and there's not going to be any interaction between our myosin heads and our actin filaments. So with calcium in the picture now, that is going to change the conformation of that protein. Troponin is just a regulatory protein. Um, so troponin, the, the troponin tropomyosin complex then changes shape that exposes the active sites on the thin filaments and that makes them available to bind with our myosin heads. So remember this is representing our thin filaments within the muscle fiber and then a single uh, myosin molecule which would be part of a thick filament. All right, so contraction itself essentially relies on ATP molecules being utilized here. So ATP is our cellular currency. An ATP molecule is going to bind to the myosin head. And then we have a special enzyme called myosin ATPase that hydrolyzes the ATP into ADP, adenosine diphosphate, and its phosphate group. So ATP, adenosine triphosphate, once we actually utilize it to do this mechanical work, the phosphate, one of the phosphate groups cleaves off and we're left with an adenosine diphosphate and that phosphate group. Um, that causes a release of energy, which in turn causes the myosin head to change shape, which will allow it to interact with the actin. At this point, we have what's known as a cross bridge occurring between the myosin head and the G actin of the actin filament. The myosin binds to the exposed active site, and that is re referred to as a cross bridge between actin and myosin. So we have our open binding site, troponin, which is bound to that calcium ion, along with the tropomyosin, have moved out of the way, exposed that binding site, and we have uh, with utilization of ATP, we have the myosin head actually forming that cross bridge. 
And then myosin is going to release its adenosine diphosphate and its phosphate group. That causes another conformational change. So the myosin head changes shape again and drags the actin filament with it. That is known as a power stroke. So basically what's occurring here is movement. The myosin head has bonded to that active site on the thin filament and it will actually, basically all these little myosin heads here are going to be able to grab hold of that actin filament and more overlap will then occur because those myosin heads are essentially dragging the actin towards what's known as the M line here within the sarcomere. So this whole structural functional unit of muscle here is going to shorten and that's going to, in, in the whole muscle, that's going to uh, cause the whole muscle to shorten. Muscle is going to pull on the tendons that it's attached to, which are then going to pull on bones, and then we have movement curve. All right, so at, um, at the end of the contraction phase, a new ATP molecule is going to bind to myosin and it breaks that cross bridge. And then the myosin head undergoes what's known as a recovery stroke, changes shape again. The new ATP is then hydrolyzed and the process can repeat. Okay, so when we look at relaxation, it's essentially we're taking away the stimulation from the nerve. So the nerve fiber stops stimulating the muscle fiber. Um, and as a result of that, we don't have the influx of calcium within the nerve fiber. We do not have the release of acetylcholine from those synaptic vesicles. Uh, the remaining acetylcholine that was interacting with its receptors on the sarcolemma dissociates. And then our acetylcholine esterase, the enzyme, breaks down acetylcholine. The calcium ion release halts and the remaining ions are reabsorbed. Calcium within the cytosol drops. Remember cytosol, we're talking about our muscle fiber here. So calcium levels drop, the calcium dissociates from troponin and is not replaced at that point. And then tropomyosin once again will block active sites on the actin and then myosin can no longer attach so we don't have contraction occurring. So if you understand the first three phases, relaxation is pretty intuitive because we're just taking away all of those signals in the form um, of ions and our neurotransmitter ACH. We're just taking those elements away such that we can no longer undergo muscle contraction. All right, so this is just kind of a nice review that has all of these figures from the Saladin textbook. Um, I recommend reviewing, um, reading uh, this process in your book as well, and perhaps watching some of the videos that are available on YouTube, um, like the Crash Course A&P video, um, because this, this is a concept that, that takes a while to understand, um, just because there are so many moving parts and key players. Uh, but I think once you understand what those key players are and what they do, uh, it's pretty manageable to understand, but let me know if you have any questions, and thank you for listening.